Section 26 of Diaries, Volume 1, by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. 7th September, 1651. I went to visit Mr. Hobbes, the famous philosopher of Malmesbury, with whom I had long acquaintance. From his window we saw the whole equipage and glorious cavalcade of the young French monarch Louis the Fourteenth passing to Parliament, when first he took the kingly government on him, now being in his fourteenth year, out of his minority and the Queen Regent's pupilage. First came the captain of the King's aides, at the head of fifty, richly liveried, next the Queen Mother's light horse, one hundred, the lieutenant being all over covered with embroidery and ribbons, having before him four trumpets, habited in black velvet, full of lace and casks of the same. Then the king's light horse, two hundred, richly habited, with four trumpets in blue velvet, embroidered with gold, before whom rode the Count d'Orlon coronet, whose belt was set with pearl. Next went the Grand Prévost's company on foot, with the Prévost on horseback. After them, the Swiss in black velvet toque, led by two gallant cavaliers, habited in scarlet-covered satin, after their country fashion, which is very fantastic. He had in his cap a panache of heron, with a band of diamonds, and about him twelve little Swiss boys, with halberds. Then came the aide de ceremonie. Next the grandees of court, governors of places, and lieutenant-general of provinces, magnificently habited and mounted, among whom I must not forget the Chevalier Paul, famous for many sea fights and signal exploits there, because it is said he had never been an academist, and yet governed a very unruly horse, and besides his rich suit, his mortar cross was esteemed at what ten thousand crowns. These were headed by two trumpets and the whole troop, covered with golds, jewels and rich caparisons, were followed by six trumpets in blue velvet also, preceding as many heralds in blue velvet semi, with fleur-de-lis caduches in their hands and velvet caps on their heads. Behind them came one of the masters of the ceremonies, then diverse marshals and many of their nobility, exceeding splendid behind them, Count d'Arcourt, Grand Ecuyer, alone carrying the king's sword in a scarf, which he held up in a blue sheath, studded with fleur-de-lis. His horse had for reins two scarves of black taffeta. Then came abundance of footmen and pages of the king, new liveried with white and red feathers, next the garde du corps and other officers, and lastly appeared the king himself on an Isabella barb, on which a housing semi with crosses of the order of the Holy Ghost and fleur de lis. The king himself, like a young Apollo, was in a suit so covered with rich embroidery that one could perceive nothing of the stuff under it. He went almost the whole way with his hat in hand, saluting the ladies and acclamators who had filled the windows with their beauty and the air with vive le roi. He seemed a prince of a grave yet sweet countenance. After the king followed diverse great persons of the court, exceeding splendid, also his esquires, masters of horse, on foot, then the company of exem de garde and six guards of scotch, between their files of diverse princes of the blood, dukes and lords. After all these, the Queen's guard of Swiss, pages and footmen. Then the Queen Mother herself, in a rich coach with Monsieur the King's brother, the Duke of Orléans, and some of the other lords and ladies of honour. About the coach marched her exem de garde, then the company of the King's gendarmes, well mounted, a hundred and fifty, with four trumpets, and as many of the queens. Lastly, an innumerable company of coaches, full of ladies and gallants. In this equipage, passed the monarch to the Parliament, henceforth exercising his kingly government. 15th September, 1651. I accompanied Sir Richard Brown, my father-in-law, to the French court, where he had a favourable audience of the French king, 
and the Queen, his mother, congratulating the one on his coming to the exercise of his royal charge and the other's prudent and happy administration during her late regency, desiring both to preserve the same amity for his master our king as they had hitherto done, which they both promised, with many civil expressions and words of course upon such occasions. We are accompanied, both going and returning, by the introductor of ambassadors and aid of ceremonies. I also saw the audience of Morosini, the ambassador of Venice, and diverse other ministers of state, from German princes, Savoy, etc. Afterward I took a walk in the King's Gardens, where I observed that the mall goes the whole square there of next the wall, and bends with an angle so made as to glance the wall. The angle is of stone. There is a basin at the end of the garden, fed by a noble fountain and high jetto. There were in it two or three boats, in which the king now and then rows about. In another part is a complete fort, made with bastions, graft, half-moons, ravelas, and furnished with great guns, cast on purpose to instruct the king in fortification. 22nd September 1651 Arrived the news of the fatal battle at Worcester, which exceedingly mortified our expectations. 28th September 1651 I was shown a collection of books and prints made for the Duke of York. 1st October 1651 The Dean of Peterborough, Dr. Cozin, preached on Job 13, verse 15, encouraging our trust in God on all events and extremities, and for establishing and comforting some ladies of great quality who were then to be discharged from our Queen Mother's service unless they would go over to the Romish Mass. The Dean, dining this day at our house, told me the occasion of publishing those offices, which among the Puritans were wont to be called Cozin's Cousining, Diversions, by way of derision. At the first coming of the Queen into England, she and her French ladies were often upbraiding our religion, that had neither appointed nor set forth any hours of prayer or breveries, by which ladies and courtiers, who have much spare time, might edify and be in devotion, as they had. Our Protestant ladies, scandalised, it seemed, at this, moved the matter to the King, whereupon His Majesty presently called Bishop White to him and asked his thoughts of it, and whether there might not be found some forms of prayer proper on such occasions, collected out of some already approved forms, that so the court ladies and others, who spent much time in trifling, might at least appear as devout, and be so too, as the new come over French ladies, who took occasion to reproach our want of zeal and religion on which the bishop told his majesty that it might be done easily and was very necessary, whereupon the king commanded him to employ some person of the clergy to compile such a work, and presently the bishop, naming Dr. Cozin, the king enjoined him to charge the doctor in his name to set about it immediately. This the dean told me he did, and three months after, bringing the book to the king, he commanded the Bishop of London to read it over and make his report. This was so well liked that, contrary to former custom of doing it by a chaplain, he would needs give it an imprimatur under his own hand. Upon this there were at first only two hundred copies printed. Nor, said he, was there anything in the whole book of my own composure, nor did I set any name as author to it, but those necessary prefaces, etc., out of the fathers, touching the times and seasons of prayer, all the rest being entirely translated and collected out of an office published by authority of Queen Elizabeth, anno 1560, and our own liturgy. This I rather mention to justify that industrious and pious dean who had exceedingly suffered by it, as if he had done it of his own head to introduce popery, from which no man was more averse, and one who in this time of temptation and apostasy held and confirmed many to our church. 29th October 1651 Came news and letters to the Queen and Sir Richard Brown, who was the first that had intelligence of it, of His Majesty's miraculous escape after the fight at Worcester, which exceedingly rejoiced us. 7th November 1651 
I visited Sir Kenelm Digby, with whom I had much discourse on chemical matters. I showed him a particular way of extracting oil of sulphur, and he gave me a certain powder with which he affirmed that he had fixed mercury before the late king. He advised me to try and digest a little better, gave me a water which he said was only rainwater of the autumnal equinox, exceedingly rectified, very volatile. It had a taste of a strong vitriolic and smelt like aqua fortis. He intended it for a dissolvent of cacks of gold, but the truth is Sir Kenelm was an arrant mountebank. Came news of the gallant Earl of Derby's execution by the rebels. 14th November 1651 Dr. Clare preached on Genesis 28 verses 20, 21, 22 upon Jacob's vow, which he appositely applied, it being the first Sunday His Majesty came to chapel after his escape. I went in the afternoon to visit the Earl of Norwich. He lay at the Lord of Aubigny's. 16th November 1651 Visited Dean Stewart, who had been sick about two days. When going up to his lodging I found him dead, which affected me much, as besides his particular affection and love to me, he was of incomparable parts and great learning, of exemplary life, and a very great loss to the whole church. He was buried the next day with all our church's ceremonies, many noble persons accompanying the corpse. 17th November 1651 I went to congratulate the marriage of Mrs Gardiner, maid of honour, lately married to that odd person Sir Henry Wood, but riches do many things. To see Monsieur Fabure's course of chemistry, where I found Sir Kenelp Digby and diverse curious persons of learning and quality, it was his first opening the course and preliminaries in order to operations. 1st December 1651 I now resolved to return to England. 3rd December 1651 Sir Lewis Dives dined with us, who, relating some of his adventures, showed me diverse pieces of broad gold, which, being in his pocket in a fight, preserved his life, by receiving a musket bullet on them, which deadened its violence, so that it went no further, but made such a stroke on the gold as fixed the impressions upon one another, battering and bending several of them. The bullet itself was flatted, and retained on it the colour of the gold. He assured us that of a hundred of them, which it seems he then had in his pocket, not one escaped without some blemish. He affirmed that his being protected by a Neapolitan prince, who connived at his bringing some horses into France, contrary to the order of the Viceroy, by assistance of some banditti, was the occasion of a difference between those great men, and consequently of the late civil war in that kingdom, the Viceroy having killed the prince, standing on his defence at his own castle. He told me that the second time of the Scots coming into England, the king was six times their number, and might easily have beaten them, but was betrayed, as were all other his designs and counsels, by some even of his bedchamber, meaning Monsieur Hamilton, who copied Montrose's letters from time to time when His Majesty was asleep. 11th December 1651 came to visit me Mr. Obadiah Walker of University College with his two pupils, the sons of my worthy friend Henry Hildyard Esquire, whom I had recommended to his care. 21st note, December 1651 came to visit my wife Mrs. Lane, the lady who conveyed the king to the seaside that his escape from Worcester. Mr. John Cosin, son of the Dean, debauched by the priests, wrote a letter to me to mediate for him with his father. I prepared for my last journey, being now resolved to leave France altogether. 25th December 1651 
the king and duke received the sacrament first by themselves, the lords Byron and Wilmot holding the long towel all along the altar. 26th December 1651 came news of the death of that rebel Ireton. 31st December 1651 preached Dr. Wally, after which was celebrated the Holy Communion, which I received also, preparative of my journey, being now resolved to leave France altogether, and to return God Almighty thanks for his gracious protection of me this past year. 2nd January 1651-52 News of my sister Glanville's death in childbed, which exceedingly affected me. I went to one Mark Antonio, an incomparable artist in enamelling. He wrought by the lamp figures in boss, of a large size, even to the life, so that nothing could be better moulded. He told us stories of a Genoese jeweller who had the great Arcanum and had made projection before him several times. He met him at Cyprus, travelling into Egypt. In his return from whence he died at sea, and the secret with him, that else he had promised to have left it to him, that all his effects were seized on and dissipated by the Greeks in the vessel to an immense value. He also affirmed that being in a goldsmith's shop at Amsterdam, a person of very low stature came in and desired the goldsmith to melt him a pound of lead, which done, he unscrewed the pommel of his sword and taking out of a little box a small quantity of powder, casting it into the crucible, poured an ingot out, which when cold he took up, saying, Sir, you will be paid for your lead in the crucible, and so went out immediately. When he was gone, the goldsmith found four ounces of good gold in it, but could never set eye again on the little man, though he sought all the city for him. Antonio asserted this with great obtestation, nor know I what to think of it. There are so many impostors and people who love to tell strange stories, as this artist did, who had been a great rover and spoke ten different languages. 13th January 1652 I took leave of Mr Waller, who, having been proscribed by the rebels, had obtained of them permission to return, was going to England. 29th January 1652 Abundance of my French and English friends and some Germans came to take leave of me and I set out in a coach for Calais in an exceedingly hard frost which had continued for some time. We got that night to Beaumont, 30th to Beauvais. 31st we found the ways very deep with snow and it was exceedingly cold. Dined at Poix, lay at Pernay a miserable cottage of miserable people in a wood, wholly unfurnished, but in a little time we had sorry beds and some provision, which they told me they hid in the wood for fear of the frontier enemy, the garrisons near them continually plundering what they had. They were often infested with wolves. I cannot remember that I ever saw more miserable creatures. 1st February 1652 I dined at Abbeville. Second, dined at Montreuil, lay at Boulogne. Third, came to Calais by eleven in the morning. I thought to have embarked in the evening, but for fear of pirates plying near the coast, I dared not trust our small vessel, and stayed till Monday following, when two or three lusty vessels were to depart. I brought with me from Paris Mr. Christopher Ways, some time before made to resign his fellowship in King's College, Cambridge, because he would not take the covenant. He had been a soldier in Flanders and came miserable to Paris. From his excellent learning and some relation he had to Sir R. Brown, I bore his charges into England and clad and provided for him till he should find some better condition, and he was worthy of it. There came with us also Captain Griffiths, Mr Tyrell, brother to Sir Timothy Tyrell of Shotover, near Oxford. At Calais I dined with my Lord Wentworth and met with Mr Heath, 
Sir Richard Lloyd, Captain Payne, and divers of our banished friends, of whom understanding that the Count de la Strade, Governor of Dunkirk, was in the town, who had brought my wife's picture, taken by pirates at sea the year before, my wife having sent it for me in England, as my Lord of Norwich had informed me at Paris, I made my address to him who frankly told me that he had such a picture in his own bedchamber among other ladies, and how he came by it. Seeming well pleased that it was his fortune to preserve it for me, and he generously promised to send it to any friend I had at Dover. I mentioned a French merchant there, and so took my leave. 6 February 1652 I embarked early in the packet boat, but put my goods in a stouter vessel. It was calm, so that we got not to Dover till late at night. I took horse for Canterbury, and lay at Rochester, next day to Gravesend, took a pair of oars, and landed at Say's Court, where I stayed three days to refresh, and look after my packet and goods, sent by a stouter vessel. I went to visit my cousin Richard Fanshaw, and divers other friends. 6th March 1652 Saw the magnificent funeral of that arch-rebel Ireton carried in pomp from Somerset House to Westminster, accompanied with diverse regiments of soldiers, horse and foot. Then marched the mourners, General Cromwell, his father-in-law, his mock parliament men, officers, and forty poor men in gowns, three led horses in housings of black cloth, two led in black velvet, and his charging horse all covered over with embroidery and gold, on crimson velvet. Then the guidons, ensigns, four heralds, carrying the arms of the state, as they called it, namely the Red Cross and Ireland, with the cask, wreath, sword, spurs, etc. Next a chariot, canopied of black velvet, and six horses, in which was the corpse. The pool held up by the mourners on foot, the mason's sword, with other marks of his charge in Ireland, where he died of the plague, carried before in black scarfs. Thus, in a grave pace, drums covered with cloth, soldiers reversing their arms, they proceeded through the streets in a very solemn manner. This Ireton was a stout rebel, and had been very bloody to the king's party. Witness his severity at Colchester, when in cold blood he put to death those gallant gentlemen Sir Charles Lucas and Sir George Lyle. My cousin R. Fanshaw came to visit me and informed me of many considerable affairs. Sir Henry Herbert presented me with his brother, my Lord Cherbury's book, De Veritate. Deptford, 9th March 1652. I went to Deptford, where I made preparation for my settlement, no more intending to go out of England, but endeavour a settled life, either in this or some other place, there being now so little appearance of any change for the better, all being entirely in the rebels' hands. And this particular habitation and the estate contiguous to it, belonging to my father-in-law, actually in His Majesty's service, very much suffering from want of some friend to rescue it out of the power of the usurpers, so as to preserve our interest and take some care of my other concerns. By the advice and endeavour of my friends, I was advised to reside in it and compound with the soldiers. This I was, besides authorised by His Majesty to do, and encouraged with a promise that what was in lease from the Crown, if ever it pleased God to restore him, he would secure to us in Fee Farm. I had also addresses and ciphers to correspond with his majesty and ministers abroad, upon all which inducements I was persuaded to settle henceforth in England, having now run about the world, most part out of my own country, near ten years. I therefore now likewise meditated sending over for my wife, whom as yet I had left at Paris. 14th March 1652. I went to Lewisham, where I heard an honest sermon on 1 Corinthians 2, 5-7, to 
being the first Sunday I had been at church since my return, it being now a rare thing to find a priest of the Church of England in a parish pulpit, most of which were filled with independents and fanatics. 15th March 1652, I saw the diamond and ruby launched in the dock at Deptford, carrying 48 brass cannon each, Cromwell and his grandees present with great acclamations. 18th March 1652, that worthy divine Mr. Owen of Eltham, a sequestered person, came to visit me. London. 19th March 1652, invited by Lady Gerard, I went to London, where we had a great supper. All the vessels, which were innumerable, were of porcelain, she having the most ample and richest collection of that curiosity in England. 22nd March 1652, I went with my brother Evelyn to Watton, to give him what directions I was able about his garden, which he was now desirous to put into some form, but for which he was to remove a mountain overgrown with huge trees and thicket, with a moat within ten yards of the house. This my brother immediately attempted, and that without great cost, for more than a hundred yards south, by digging down the mountain and flinging it in into a rapid stream. It not only carried away the sand, etc., but filled up the moat and levelled that noble area where now the garden and fountain is. The first occasion of my brother making this alteration was my building the little retiring place between the great wood eastward next the meadow, where some time after my father's death I made a triangular pond or little stew with an artificial rock after my coming out of Flanders. 29th March 1652 I heard that excellent prelate, the primate of Ireland, Jacobus Usher, preach in Lincoln's Inn on Hebrews 4.16, encouraging of penitent sinners. 5th April 1652. My brother George brought to Say's court Cromwell's act of oblivion to all that would submit to the government. 13th April 1652. News was brought me that Lady Cotton, my brother George's wife, was delivered of a son. I was moved by a letter out of France to publish the letter which some time since I sent to Dean Cozen's proselyted son, but I did not conceive it convenient for fear of displeasing Her Majesty the Queen. 15th April 1652 I wrote to the Dean touching my buying his library, which was one of the choicest collections of any private person in England. The Count de Strade most generously and handsomely sent me the picture of my wife from Dunkirk in a large tin case without any charge. It is of Monsieur Bourdon and is that which has the dog in it and is to the knees but has been somewhat spoiled by washing it ignorantly with soap suds. 25th April 1652 I went to visit Alderman Kendrick, a fanatic Lord Mayor who had married a relation of ours, where I met with a captain who had been thirteen times to the East Indies. 29th April 1652 was that celebrated eclipse of the sun, so much threatened by the astrologers, and which had so exceedingly alarmed the whole nation, that hardly any one would work, nor stir out of their houses, so ridiculously were they abused by knavish and ignorant stargazers. We went this afternoon to see the Queen's house at Greenwich, now given by the rebels to Bolstrode Whitelock, one of their unhappy councillors and keeper of pretended liberties. 10th May 1652. Passing by Smithfield, I saw a miserable creature burning who had murdered her husband. I went to see some workmanship of that admirable artist Reeves, famous for perspective and turning curiosities in ivory. 29th May 1652. 
I went to give order about a coach to be made against my wife's coming, being my first coach, the pattern whereof I brought out of Paris. 30th May 1652 I went to obtain of my Lord Devonshire that my nephew George might be brought up with my young lord, his son, to whom I was recommending Mr. Ways. I also inspected the manner of camleting silk and grograms at one Monsieur Adore in Moorfields, and thence to Colonel Morley, one of their council of state, as then called, who had been my schoolfellow, to request to pass my wife's safe landing and the goods she was to bring with her out of France which he courteously granted, and did me many other kindnesses that was a great matter in those days. In the afternoon at Charlton Church, where I heard a rabbinical sermon, here is a fair monument in black marble of Sir Adam Newton, who built that fair house near it for Prince Henry, and where my noble friend Sir Henry Newton succeeded him. 3rd June 1652 I received a letter from Colonel Morley to the magistrates and searchers at Rye to assist my wife at her landing and show her all civility. 4th June 1652 I set out to meet her now on her journey from Paris after she had obtained leave to come out of that city which had now been besieged some time by the Prince of Condé's army in the time of the rebellion and after she had been now near twelve years from her own country, that is, since five years of age, at which time she went over. I went to Rye to meet her, where was an embargo on occasion of the late conflict with the Holland fleet, the two nations being now in war, and which made sailing very unsafe. On Whit Sunday I went to the church, which is a very fair one, and heard one of the cantors who dismissed the assembly rudely and without any blessing. Here I stayed till the tenth with no small impatience when I walked over to survey the ruins of Winchelsea, that ancient sink port which by the remains and ruins of ancient streets and public structures discovers it to have been formerly a considerable and large city. There are to be seen vast caves and vaults, walls and towers, ruins of monasteries and of a sumptuous church in which are some handsome monuments, especially of the Templars, buried just in the manner of those in the Temple at London. This place being now all in rubbish and a few despicable hovels and cottages only standing, hath yet a mare. The sea which formerly rendered it a rich and commodious port had now forsaken it. 11th June 1652 About four in the afternoon, being at Bowles on the Green, we discovered a vessel which proved to be that in which my wife was, and which got into the harbour about eight that evening, to my no small joy. They had been three days at sea, and escaped the Dutch fleet, through which they passed, taken for fishers, which was great good fortune, there being seventeen bales of furniture and other rich plunder, which I bless God came all safe to land, together with my wife and my lady Brown, her mother, who accompanied her. My wife being discomposed by having been so long at sea, we set not forth toward home till the 14th, when hearing the smallpox was very rife in and about London, and Lady Brown having a desire to drink Tunbridge waters, I carried them thither and stayed in a very sweet place, private and refreshing, and took the waters myself till the 23rd, when I went to prepare for their reception, leaving them for the present in their little cottage by the wells. End of section 26